Today, we'll be talking about invasive species and endangered species. This lesson was made by John Bentz and Mariah Thrush as part of Ohio University's NSF-funded Boat of Knowledge in the Science Classroom. First, watch the video Overstepping Boundaries, the Danger of Invasive Species, then discuss the following questions after pausing the video. Invasive species are non-native species that have been introduced to an ecosystem and are negatively affecting other plants and animals. They harm not only native plants and animals, but they can also harm crops and cause damage to natural ecosystems and man-made structures. We saw several invasive species in the video, such as Asian carp and lionfish, but other examples include giant Phragmites grass in the Great Lakes and kudzu vine in the southern U.S. We'll talk about invasive versus non-native species later, but beneficial non-native species include most food crops like corn and other cultivated fruits and vegetables. We can prevent spreading invasive species by avoiding moving organisms from place to place and cleaning any objects that have been in water or dirt before putting them in different environments. Invasive species are defined as non-native species introduced into an area, either deliberately or accidentally, that negatively impact the ecosystem and environment. Notice that some invasive species have been accidental, but others have been deliberately introduced by humans. So how do invasive species differ from non-native species? Pause the video and discuss this with your classmates. Sometimes, differentiating between non-native and invasive species can be difficult, but a diagram can make it easy. The larger green circle represents non-native species, and the smaller blue circle represents invasive species. Notice that there is space where the circles don't overlap. That space represents species that are non-native, but not invasive. The invasive species circle is totally enclosed in the non-native species circle, meaning that all invasive species are non-native. A simple way of stating this is that not all non-native species are invasive, but all invasive species are non-native. As with most concepts in science, there can be a few exceptions to the rule. There are a few very rare documented cases of native species becoming invasive, but this is due to environments being altered, usually by humans. For our purposes, we will consider these situations outliers and focus on non-native invasive species. Invasive species are across the globe, including many species in Ohio. Some of the most troublesome invasive species here include zebra mussels in Lake Erie, Asian carp in the Ohio River and a few other waterways, and multiflora rows in both residential and rural areas. One of the most problematic invasive species is the zebra mussel in the Great Lakes. It's not exactly clear how zebra mussels arrived to the lakes, but current theory is that zebra mussels were transported into the U.S. in the ballast water of a ship coming from the Black Sea into Lake St. Clair in the late 1980s. So why are zebra mussels a problem? Zebra mussels reproduce quickly and attach to any available surfaces including native clams and mussels, and any man-made structures in the water. This picture shows a cross-section of a pipe completely clogged with zebra mussels. If boats or other equipment underwater isn't cleaned frequently, then zebra mussels will attach. Though the zebra mussels were initially detected in only two locations, their numbers quickly grew as they invaded the Great Lakes. By 1991, the zebra mussels had started to make their way beyond the Great Lakes and into major rivers, including the Mississippi River. From here, the situation only gets worse. By 2010, zebra mussels had spread into the western U.S. Most recently, the zebra mussel is still spreading, though the rate of spread has slowed. Pipes clogging with zebra mussels were especially problematic, and Dr. Chang from Ohio University found a solution. Dr. Chang created an anti-fouling or anti-clogging system to keep zebra mussels at bay. 
anti-fouling paint has also been painted in, onto ships, boats, and other equipment to slow the attachment and growth of zebra mussels, barnacles, and algae. Asian carp is another problematic invader in the U.S. Species like big head carp and silver carp are species that are causing so many problems. The Asian carp were imported into the southern U United States to help keep algae in aquaculture ponds in check. Several floods came through the region, such as this flood in 1992, and the carp were able to escape. The escaped carp were able to reproduce quickly and outcompete many native fish. Asian carp are a destructive force for both native species in the rivers and humans in the water. In this video, you can see fish jumping out of the water as boats go by. It's believed that boat motors create pressure waves that travel through the water. The carp detect the pressure waves and think there's a predator close, so they jump out of the water as a survival tactic. The invasive Asian carp are widespread across U.S. waterways, especially in Midwest rivers like the Illinois, Ohio, and Mississippi rivers. So far, no Asian carp have been detected in the Great Lakes, the carp have been discovered in the waterways leading into the Great Lakes. The best way to keep invasive Asian carp populations in check is to prevent them from spreading. This means that environmental groups are constantly monitoring waters that are at risk of carp invasions and are removing as many carp as possible from waters, as well as introducing sterile carp to slow and stop reproduction. As for areas that have already been invaded, there's not much to do, unfortunately. Some advocate that fishermen catch and eat as many possible to lower and eliminate population, but most people won't eat, and won't eat Asian carp. Another group, as you'll see in this video, has found an entertaining and dangerous way to lower Asian carp numbers. This is not an effective management practice and is not recommended by any land managers or environmental agencies. In other words, don't do this at home, kids. Endangered species are defined as an animal or plant in danger of extinction within the foreseeable future throughout all or a significant portion of its range. There are 119 endangered species in Ohio designated by the Ohio Division of Natural Resources. Some of the endangered species in, in Ohio include Appalachian grizzled skippers, which is a butterfly, the timber rattlesnake, and the Indiana bat. Some species aren't as close to extinction as endangered species, but they're still having troubles. These are called threatened species, and they are defined as any species in which it is likely to become an endangered species within the foreseeable future throughout all or significant portion of its range. Endangered species in Ohio include the northern long-eared bat, the red knot, which is a bird, and the copper belly water snake. Pause the video and take a few seconds to talk about the difference between endangered and threatened species. Endangered species have a closer, clearer threat of extinction, whereas threatened species have a possibility of problems with extinction. When a species is listed as endangered or threatened, it doesn't mean that it's doomed to extinction. On the contrary, species noted as endangered or threatened tend to get extra conservation efforts. For the bobcat, the extra efforts paid off and was delisted because of numbers in Ohio are no longer low. Let's talk about how we protect endangered species. Just as the government has responsibilities to prevent and contain invasive species, they also have responsibilities to protect endangered species. Federal agencies are required under the National Environmental Policy Act to prepare an environmental impact statement for any major project that might substantially alter environmental qualities. We'll use the US 33 Nelsonville bypass as a case study to demonstrate how we can protect all species, especially endangered species during land development. The Nelsonville Bypass was originally proposed in the 1960s, but the 1970s oil and gas embargo halted construction. The project was revived in the 2000s, and funding was received in 2007 to begin construction. The bypass was constructed in three phases and was completed in late 2013. 
It's eight and a half miles in length and goes through a portion of the Wayne National Forest. There are some advantages to having the Nelsonville bypass in place. Ease of traffic congestion through Nelsonville and higher speed possible on the bypass. Unfortunately, there are no advantages for wildlife along the bypass. The bypass runs through Wayne National Forest, which means some habitat was completely destroyed, including habitat of endangered species in the area. The road construction also causes disturbance of the surrounding habitat, which creates opportunities for invasive species to move into the area. The Nelsonville Bypass is made for easier, faster travel from Columbus to Athens, but there is another disadvantage to the wildlife that I haven't mentioned yet. Look at this picture and discuss what problem the bypass creates for the environment and species in the area. The bypass cuts right through the forest, which leads to forest fragmentation. So why is for forest fragmentation a bad thing? Pause the video and take a few minutes to discuss. When the forest is fragmented, the habitat of native species is fragmented. As the habitat is split into pieces, the pieces become smaller and traveling between the pieces can be dangerous or impossible. Think of roadkill. Those are animals that risk traveling from one habitat piece to another and were killed in the process. So how are biologists and engineers helping endangered species along the Nelsonville bypass? Several mitigation techniques or techniques that reduce threats to endangered species have been put in place. For the Indiana bat, light poles were increased in height, so there's less of a chance of bats being hit by cars. Snake fences deter snakes from traveling across the road and instead diverts them to animal underpasses. The Appalachian grizzled skipper won't travel through dark tunnels, so a bridge was built with gaps between lanes to allow light to shine through and encourage the skippers to travel there. Animal underpasses, snake fences, and extra tall fences with deer jump out areas help to protect native animals, especially endangered species. To tie everything together, there's one last question. How are invasive species and endangered species related to one another? Pause the video and discuss. When invasive species come into a habitat, it negatively affects other species, possibly causing native organisms to become endangered or threatened. Already endangered or threatened species are even more sensitive to the negative effects of endangered species. The best method to protect endangered or threatened species from invasive species is to prevent invasive species from spreading. Don't move plants into non-native areas and never release unwanted pets or other animals into the wild.